Welcome to our little live stream. Welcome to COVID-19. We have had, as you may have seen, many, many technical issues with getting live. Zoom appears to be the world's video streaming thing of choice, and it seems to be Saturday morning. Everyone wants to FaceTime their mum. So well done to all the mums out there getting lots of FaceTime, but didn't really do much for my my heart. I reckon it's out. phone sex. <laughs> Not with their mum. <laughs> Indeed. For their mum, yeah. Indeed. Right. Okay. <laughs> I just need to figure out a couple of different things. Right. So while I'm getting things sorted, firstly, let's say welcome to our first presenters. We've got Ross all the way from sunny, sunny Dubai. We've got Florence from, I'm going to say London, and yeah. Nick, I'm going to say from Munich, if I'm right. I don't know. Berlin. There we go. Okay, guys. So if you just do a little bit of an intro, who you are, what you do, I'll see if I can make sure behind the scenes I'm getting everything nicely set up and working. So let's start with you, Big Nick. Off you go. I am Big Nick. I am a MNU certified nutritionist. I am a level two strength and conditioning coach. I'm a PT. I am a semi-pro rugby player. Uh, I play in Germany in the top leagues. Um, and yeah, I met everybody here pretty much through um, studying nutrition. I'm currently studying performance nutrition. Uh, and yeah, it's basically my hobby, my life, uh, my passion. So that's what I am, what I do, and why I'm here. Cool. Awesome, man. Flo? Um, hello. I'm uh, Flo Seabright. So I'm a personal trainer and an m &E certified nutritionist. I have a personal training um, and online coaching business called Fit by Flow and a nutrition consultancy called Intake Nutrition. Um, I started originally as a dancer. I got injured um, and moved into uh, fitness from that. Um, so it's been a bit of a mixed background, but yeah, I love it. It's a bit all encompassing when you get involved in it. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Awesome. And have we got Ross? Have we got Ross? He looks a bit frozen on my screen. <laughs> I, <thought so. laughs> I don't know if he is there or not. So let's see. Ross, are think, you there? I think he's just really still. He's just really still. He's just really kind of like in the moment, in the zone. Yeah, and really pixelated as well. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. We were a little bit late getting started. Um, so cool. So this first talk is all going to be about movement, mobility, muscle gain, the importance of movement, the importance of mobility, and maybe why some people are overlooking it at their peril. So as Ross is frozen, I think we'll start with Flo and her particular question that we're going to move to. So I think that many people often cite like a lack of time as a reason for not being able to work out. So how can people incorporate mobility and movement into their daily lives without it becoming just another thing that they have to find time for that they have to do how can they can kind of incorporate it in everyday life um so a couple of things i would say the first thing would be to kind of look at the approach so um i think if you can understand why it's valuable it becomes a lot easier to start thinking about start prioritizing it um so I think if you can kind of say to people, okay, well, what's the trade-off for not doing it? So especially with mobility work, like there's, if you neglect your mobility work, there's a big, um, a much greater chance of getting injured. And ultimately what's worse, kind of five to 10 minutes in the gym with mobility on top of a workout you're probably already doing or an injury that can have you out for, you know, a couple of months. Um, so I think getting people to understand why it's valuable um, and how they're actually maximizing their current efforts. So like, especially with muscle gain, um, by incorporating that mobility work, you're going to be maximizing the work that you're already doing. Um, and then when it comes to actually kind of fitting it in practically, I think habit formation is a big thing. I think with clients um, I've worked with, they kind of ask like, where can I find the motivation? And I actually think that habit trumps motivation hands down all the time. So you can, I mean, even as a trainer, we're not always motivated to train or do our mobility work or do the things that are good, good for us. Um, but we tend to have pretty strong habits that kind of tick us along. Um, so yeah, I would encourage that kind of habit formation to keep you kind of consistent. Um, 
and potentially laying ha habits that you already have with new habits. So for instance, people tend to have like an evening routine. So if they're in like watching television for an hour before bed, that's a really easy way to do two things at once and do a little bit of work towards their goals whilst kind of chilling out and watching telly. So I think it's breaking it down into manageable steps, layering it on top of habits you already have and understanding the value of it. Mm -hmm. And so you've got someone, I don't know, someone like in a, an office or something like that. Do you suggest that they like move constantly throughout the day, do little things at their desk? Or I, I said, we're all, we're all going to be sat here for a while doing these talks. So yeah. should we all be doing some sort of twisty mobility type stuff right now? I, I don't think it can hurt at all. I think, I mean, having a sedentary lifestyle is obviously not great in terms of like longevity and mobility and your kind of physical health long term. So I do actually work with some clients who do have And one of the things I say to them is do something like set an, hour, um, an alarm clock, either every hour on the hour or every couple of hours, just as a reminder, not even, not so you have to get up in the middle of the office and do something, you know, embarrassing, <laughs> but you can do small things at your desk that no one's really going to notice. You could kind of stand up, go to the kitchen, grab something, come back, just make sure you're not kind of seated in these positions, kind of sinking into them all day. Um, so yeah, I don't think it can hurt at all. And it's a really easy way to incorporate it into your life, you know, w without kind of feeling, as, as you said, like it's an, extra hour out of your day you know cool so, yeah, why not <laughs> awesome and nick for you how frequently do you suggest someone kind of goes about doing some form of a mobility routine routine whatever that may be i mean it's going to come down to uh what the mobility routine looks like you know how easy it is for you to do that so as flo just said if it's something as simple as getting up from your office chair and walking around a bit, then I would suggest like once an hour. But if you're talking about a full on mobility routine, like actual stretching, working on your passive and active movement and um, range of motion, um, then, you know, I reckon it's something you could easily do on any rest day, um, but it shouldn't be left just for your rest day. It's also something you should include pre and or post um, training, depending on the type of training. Like, for example, you don't want to do um, static stretching right before a strength session because the static stretching can, static stretching can result in um, slightly lower strength for that strength session. And obviously, the idea of a strength session is to continually um, lift heavier, get stronger. And so you don't want to have that static stretching um, hampering that. But it is something that you might look to do after the static uh, after the strength session. So, um, you know, how often should you do it? Like it's one of those things where if you're not moving regularly, it's going to be detrimental to your health. So if to you mobility is getting up and walking around because you have a sedentary lifestyle, then you should be doing it all the time. If to you it is a structured mobility program, like something that a physio might give you, um, that is something you should probably do every day or even multiple times a day if you have the time. And if you, you know, if it's like to fix an injury or something, then if it's, you know, pain free. Um, but as far as how often you should do it, it's going to be very, very case specific. And I know we haven't touched on um, Ross's question yet, but I know he's going to talk about some more stuff that will define the type of mobility that you're looking at doing. I mean, um, do you always want to be working on your active range? Probably not. Like it's probably going to take away from your ability to recover uh, from training sessions and, and other activity, but your passive range, you know, it's something that, you know, it will probably help you recover in time for the next session. So it's looking at um, your mobility isn't just one thing. Like it's so many different aspects. And I actually think it's something you should be doing pretty much all the time. Um, obviously not constantly, but, you know, multiple times a day, um, different forms i wouldn't do the same mobility circuit for example if you were doing a mobility circuit i wouldn't do that multiple times a day but that might be one of your um options and then another one is to just get up and walk around or another one it might be to uh open up your hips a little bit if you spend a lot of time sitting down or if you have 
shoulder issues, it might be to start working through some ranges of motion with that. So how often should you do a specific mobility routine? Uh, some mobility all the time, but the same routine probably, you know, no more than once or twice a day. Okay, cool. So Ross has unfrozen. He's not a pixel from a Disney movie anymore. Um, so while you're here, Ross, while you're live, while you are moving, uh, let me <laughs> ask you a question, which is we're talking about obviously mobility. So what are some of the um, like limitations or issues that uh, poor mobility can cause? And before we answer that question, there's a funky little feature I can do here. So as people are asking questions and comments and things like that, I can press a little button here and then their question comes up on screen. So someone thought I was actually drinking a video, which I kind of wish it was, but it's not, but uh, there you go. So if you want to ask a question of these guys, put a little comment in, it'll flash up. I'll bring you in and we can answer your question as you go. That's way better than Zoom. Over to you, Ross. Cool, so um, I guess before we can kind of adequately look at what limitations people might face, we, we kind of have to define what mobility is first and foremost. Sorry if you've done that already, because I didn't hear it, but I'll give myself. No, we left it for you. You go for it, mate. Wonderful. Um, so essentially, if you look at just in the dictionary, it's just the ability to move freely, right, or easily, but that doesn't necessarily relate wholly well to our particular context, which is people getting into the gym and, and moving weight, right? So more accurately, it would be the ability to take a joint through a full range of motion, right? Now, that's not to be confused with flexibility, which often a lot of people do. And ultimately, flexibility is just the ability of a muscle to lengthen. Now, that's certainly a component of mobility, but it isn't to be mistaken for mobility in and of itself. Uh, the best example I can usually give of that would be, say you take someone who actively practices yoga. And, you know, you guys may have experienced this as well. You take them into the gym and you put them under a bar or you put them into a you know, a free weight movement and say a squat for the first time. And even though they've got the capacity to lengthen the tissues to get into that position, they actually can't hit depth. And it's nothing to do with the fact that the muscles are able to lengthen. It's the fact that they don't have the coordination, the active control of, you know, contracting those muscle tissues at that end range. So that's a great example I would often give of kind of that whole flexibility versus mobility. It's like, can you take a joint through a range of motion with control and stability? Um, and I think other factors that you kind of have to look at with mobility is, um, you know, what are all the different, I suppose, feet, things that feed into mobility? And it's there's quite a lot of variables in play. You're kind of looking at structural factors. So best exact two examples I could give of that would be imagine the shoulder complex. So you've got that acromium space for one individual. They might have a very compact and tight acromium space um, and a rounded lip on the edge of the acromion process, whereas another individual might have quite a large amount of space for the head of the humerus to kind of move around in the socket. And so unless you've assessed structural limitations, experience for one client versus another may be very different, right? Just purely based on their structural anatomy, that's nothing that they can they can do is what they kind of were born with. Unless, of course, maybe some people sometimes go and get things shaved off and whatever else, but that's quite invasive. Um, and then you've got medical conditions like, say, osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, you look at the research, for example, it can very highly reduce the amount of force production a muscle can do. So for that's obviously going to limit the ability to control end ranges and things like that. It can affect how joints receive nutrition and nutrients, which also affects range of motion as well. Uh, you've also then got soft tissue, so myofascial adhesions. You may have neural tension blocks. Sometimes, I mean, have you ever guys ever seen that people will essentially stretch and stretch and stretch and roll and roll and roll, but then just like, I'm just not getting any better. And often that, you know, if they've got a neural block or neural tension, then all it is is that their nerve nerves are not able to glide and slide as they're meant to within the joints and the muscle tissue. So sometimes using methods like um, nerve flossing, which was popularized by Kelly Starrett and Billy Wads, um, you do that and all of a sudden it's like they've increased a whole load of range of motion. But, you know, if you could roll and stretch all day, you would never have addressed that, right? Um, and then one I think that's often hugely overlooked is agonist and antagonist relationships. So... Best example I could give of this is how many people often say, I have tight hamstrings. How many of you guys have clients say I have tight hamstrings? Yeah. Wrong number. 95% <laughs> of people come into the gym and say I have tight hamstrings, and those same 95% of people often don't have tight hamstrings. Um, and I've found you do an active or you do like a, a passive test, either lying on your back or, you know, get them on, you know, a, a, a treatment bed, and you test it and they've got that, you know, perfectly fine 70 degrees range of motion that you would expect is kind of, okay, well, that's not tight. 
Um, but then you put that same person into a hip hinge and they just can't get anywhere close to what would be acceptable for a hip hinge. Uh, and what I've often found is that often people who think they have tight hamstrings, you then test how strong their hip flexors are at active end range. Because ultimately, if you look at, like, say, a hip hinge or stretch in the hamstring, that's often accompanied with end range hip flexion, right? So you test their hip flexors at end range and they're incredibly weak. You start strengthening that, you start doing nice metrics, you start building up strength at that end range, and then you retest their hip hinge, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, that hip hinge looks wonderful, right? So, and then, of course, then you've got lifestyle factors. You maybe got, like, you know, for example, the way that we all live nowadays, the way that people, most people of our clients work, they're hugely stressed, hugely what we call sympathetically driven. So management of what's called the autonomic nervous system, that ability to switch between that fight, flight, focus response, which is a, a response we need, and that kind of rest, digest, and everything else. If you're not able to switch when you intend to between those two states, then if you're, say, for example, really highly strong, you work all the hours under the sun, you're kind of robbing yourself of sleep, you don't really look after good quality nutrition in your diet. If your body doesn't have the nutrients being delivered into the cells, then you can't expect those tissues to be healthy or pliable. So nutrition and hydration then has a huge influence on how we move as well. And often just by clients tidying up their diet, it's amazing how much more range of motion they can actually achieve just because the tissues are, are healthier tissues. Um, and yeah, and then in terms of the, the probably the last point I would give would be passive and active range mismatches. Um, so what I mean by that is, say well, you go in... Just a quick one, which is a quick one, Ross. We've got a question coming in related to that, which maybe you can um, capture at the same time. Yep. So I'll just flash it on screen for you. So before you kind of dip into that, so the question comes in is, what do you mean by active and passive mobility? So maybe as you kind of talk about that, you can cover that off at the same time. Uh, that's literally what I'm covering right now. So it's a very oh, there you go. <laughs> Perfect time. Passive and active mismatches. What does that mean? Now, the example I'll give is everyone can almost relate to like a leg press, right? You know, like a traditional 45 degree leg press. Now, you lie most people on a leg press and they're kind of always told, right, you need to get your knees as close to your chest as possible, right, to go into the bottom of that leg press. The problem is if you had to take most people, lie them on that leg press, and then without actually taking the sled off or moving any weight, if you just say, right, listen, without using your hands, without using anything else, I just want you to actively pull your knee up towards your chest and how far can you go? And the astonishing thing most people find is they don't have as much active range unloaded as they actually think they do. And so then what's all essentially happening is that when they do that leg press and they've taken it all the way into that end range that they don't own, they're essentially relying on passive structures and other you know tissues and ligaments and compressive forces in the spine to manage that load. And so when we talk about active versus passive ranges, how if you were to be taken manually, and manually also means allowing a weight to push you into a position, if I was to take someone's hip manually into flexion, chances are they can go a hell of a lot further unless they have a structural limitation than what they're able to do if they were to actively pull themselves into that position with just the muscle to try to work. So I think when we're looking at mobility as well, there's often what we call active passive mismatches. So if someone doesn't even have a very good passive range of motion, they're sure as hell not likely going to have a very good active range of motion. And so pursuit of really, really good mobility is the ability to kind of build on passive range to an acceptable point over time and then to make sure that your active range is as close to that end passive range as you possibly can. Because what that then does is it gives you what I like to call a buffer either side. You kind of have, right, if I have to go and go slightly past what I actually own, at least I know that I've got a buffer of X degrees of range of motion either side of that range, for example. And that's, the real, that's me just giving a very linear example. That's just talking about the joint moving in one plane. Of course, the joints have to be, be able to move and obviously fully articulate within the capsule or fully flex extent, et cetera. So yeah, the, to, to summarize, active passive range, active what can you do without any manual help or assistance from any external factor, passive is manually being put into an end range that your joint and muscle tissue are physically capable of getting into. Hmm. And it's a bit like it's the same example for a bench press, right? So when you're pulling your arms back to actually do that particular motion, then if you've got a weight in your hand that's say 100 kilos on a bench press, you can that plus gravity could take you far into uh, a range of motion that you don't necessarily own if you haven't necessarily assessed that, right? Yeah, hundred percent. And I think a phrase I often use with people is just because you can go somewhere doesn't mean you should. Yeah. You have to earn that over time. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Cool. Lots of questions coming in, so let's try and get through a couple of different uh, questions from people. Uh, so this one is coming: best range of motion slash mobility assessments that you use with clients. So you mentioned a couple there about um, like leg press and things like that. Are there any specific actual sequences that you go through when maybe you've got a new client or someone you're working with the first time that you say we absolutely have to do these certain mobility assessments with someone and if you guys want to fill this one first of all i crack on with that i mean something i've used previously is the functional mobility screen um and it's essentially just taking them through a set of exercises with criteria that you mark them against um if you want to take it ross and i'll see if i can get it up on my screen and maybe i can share it really quickly with everyone so you want me to just crack on for the moment until we get there? Yeah, going nuts, yeah. yeah. So I mean, I've so I actually spent time working in a, in a clinic for about six months where I got to see a lot of patients post um, post operation and post injury and stuff. And uh, to be honest, there's a lot of there's a lot of mixed opinions around the idea of you know, using FMS or the functional FM, FMS screen. And so I think the thing is is that there's a lot of tests where they're essentially testing you the competency of being able to do that test that it sometimes doesn't always cross over specifically into the, the task or the challenge that you're asking someone to do. And so, I mean, my approach over time was initially I was doing a lot of kind of like, right, I'm going to look at someone's shoulder flexion. I'm going to look at someone's ankle dorsiflexion. And then as I kind of got testing more and more bodies over time, I, why I, I kind of I suppose switched away from doing is I started doing a lot more, right, I'm going to look at you train. I'm going to look at you as I intend to see you move in the gym. And if you know what you're looking for, you can use the movements that you're intending to train to essentially address, right, well, I can see when you squat that you don't have sufficient hip internal rotation. I can see that you don't have the ankle dorsiflexion. And so the movement becomes the screen. And then if you need to, you can start using that kind of more joint by joint approach to then dive in a little bit deeper. So that's kind of how I tend to do it. So, I mean, I don't really follow as much of a, right, I follow like the FMS or the functional FMS or some of the other um, tests I've kind of used a combination of some of that stuff that I've learned and right I'm going to see what is the movement I've got that person doing and what do I need to do to address that so it becomes a bit more case by case person by person okay yeah definitely I think the the case for FMS isn't so much about getting someone to move in a certain position properly like you're right if someone needs to squat better you're better off assessing them in their squat than you are doing like an FMS and I'm by no means a FMS is the king. It's just one tool that I use to like get a general overview of somebody. Um, and I think it's a handy way to find some limitations, uh, but it's not the only way by any means. And I think you're right that looking at someone moving, if they're coming to you for a specific reason, like to fix a squat, you're better off looking at their squat than pretty much anything else. If they're coming to you because, um, you know, they just want to get better at, moving they, they sit at a desk all day then maybe something like an fms is something is a little more appropriate but generally if someone wants to run better you need to look at them run if someone wants to press better you need to look at them press like um you know what assessment would i personally use i mean i would watch them do whatever they want to get better at okay. yeah i would, I would absolutely agree with both of them actually i think it's i tend to do it on a super case by case basis and watching them move in the movements that I'm trying to get them to achieve. Um, so it will totally dependent on the client um, and also dependent on if they're coming to me with an existing issue. Um, like, as you said, Nick, if they're coming to you and they have a relatively sedentary lifestyle anyway, you kind of know some of the things you might need to start looking at initially. Um, but if they have a specific kind of niggle that they've had for a long time, you also know how to kind of work around that. So yeah, I, I would say it's, I don't follow kind of a formula with it. I would do pro probably the same as Ross in terms of case by case, looking at them within the movements we're trying to achieve. Okay, cool. And um, sorry, Simon, just to add to the next point, I think for me where I've, because I've worked with a lot of sports doctors and things as well, where the FMS really comes into its own is if you're in a sports environment where you've got a team, you haven't got time to assess all of those people on a super mm -hmm. Case, case basis so it's incredibly useful for sports organizations because it provides a quantitative way of them getting at least some initial metrics so i think where i've seen it really well utilized nick to your point is it's not that it's not a bad method it just has a probably a good time or place depending on the context yeah. cool yeah. 
And I uh, just want to like maybe build on that for some of the people who maybe aren't trainers or haven't got coaches and things like that. So this question is coming about like must have mobility exercises for sedentary people. So we talked a little bit there about assessing for various different exercises, different movements, different goals. But if someone hasn't got a coach, then sure. how do they, what's the best things that they can do to say, just improve general mobility for, for health purposes? Yeah. Um, I would say, if you guys don't mind me jumping in, um, if you kind of tend to have a relatively sedentary lifestyle, I think looking at, there are a couple of things you can start with. So I think starting with some kind of big bang for your buck movement is quite a nice way to go about it. So for instance, like hip mobility um, and ankle mobility, kind of getting to low squats. And also if you're sedentary, thinking about kind of your um, posture and your position within your spine. Um, and if you're kind of rolling forward and your shoulders are um, coming forward and if your glutes are switching off, I think there's a lot going on in terms of like hips, glutes, spine that you can start looking at as like an initial starting point um, and then start building out from that. Yep. Um to add to that, I think, yeah, 100%, I think uh, the three areas people tend to be most limited in, generally speaking, are ankles, hips, and spine, right, especially the T-spine. The lower back takes a hell of a beating just because of the fact that the hips are getting jacked up because the ankles and the feet are not healthy, and then the T-spine is super rigid, which then also contributes into the back, and because the T-spine and the hips are tight, then that's obviously creating a lot of tension in the lumbar. Now, we know that the lumbar is only really made to, to kind of flex and rotate around about 15 degrees, Whereas the, the T-spine is made to have at least around about 40, 45 degrees of rotation. So if you've not got that degree, and that's almost three times, right? So if you've not got that degree of movement in the thoracic spine, something's got to give, right? So I think um, putting the focus into those three areas is probably worthwhile. Uh, if I could give one exercise rather than seven, uh, I would say if people could learn it and they were willing to be patient with it, if you could do the best stretch in the world. Reason why is that covers pretty much every aspect of for just about of hip flexion, extension, spinal rotation, ankle mobility. Um, you guys know the best stretch in the world, right? Mm. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, that, if, if people are willing to take the time to learn it and practice it, um, if you got really good at that and really proficient at it, you're going to tick off quite a lot of boxes. And then, of course, mobility is one aspect, but a big part of mobility is also potentiation, activation, and ability to contract. So those are all very um, – it's a bit of a mixture of passive and active solutions you need to look at. And that's why I'm not a big fan of giving the top or the best of anything because, it's again, it's always going to be very individualized. What's seven best mobility exercises for one individual is not going to be the seven best for the next individual. But we know there are some general exercises that for most people are going to be fairly fairly useful, even if it's just for prehabilitation. Cool. Got it. Yeah, I'll just add one thing to that, sorry. All right. Um, First of all, you don't need to see me talk. So this is the stretch <laughs> that Ross is talking about. Um, so, but while they're doing this, I would say if you regularly sit, then you're regularly at um, you know 90 degrees with your hips, 90 degrees with your knees. Um, and the muscles that are getting short there are the ones you should probably focus on lengthening uh, when you're looking at big bang, bang for buck um, things to do. So if you're always on your phone or a laptop and you're in a rounded position with your shoulders, then you should probably look at some stretches that open up your shoulders. If you're always bent at the hips, then you should always look at something that uh, opens up the hips. Um, and it's just something that uh, is an easy way to identify what's going to be the best thing for you rather than going to a coach and finding out what they think is the best thing for you um, would be to identify places where you are getting short based on your lifestyle. So like, for example, I'll use that rounded shoulders. A lot of people, especially girls, um, have really rounded shoulders. Then um, that's exacerbated by being on your phone or reading or looking down or on your computer or whatever. And that is being exacerbated. So people are getting really long in their um, external rotator muscles and really short in like their pectorals. And so by doing things that strengthen your external rotators, and lengthen your pectoral muscles, you're already straight away going to get some uh, benefit just from that. That will help your posture. Usually, um, that's what's called upper cross syndrome. Usually, if you have upper cross syndrome, you probably have lower cross syndrome, which is um, anterior rotation of the pelvis. Um, so by working on that, you can start to work on the other thing just 
in itself. Um, as Ross has already alluded to, everything's connected. So by working on one place, you're going to start making um, compensations elsewhere. Um, and if you're in a bad position, that compensation might actually be positive. Okay, cool. Nick, we've got a specific question you really important to do with mobility. What does your mug say? It says, you're all right, you are. And then it points, <laughs> if it, it, it points at me. Unless I use my right hand, then it points at you. Uh, okay, so arrow. That's the. Uh, yeah. There you go. Sorry, I, I could have got something hilarious on there, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Uh, cool. Love the phrase "big bang for your buck." Um, cool. Another question coming in. Uh, what are your opinions on passive stretching, using weights to lengthen the muscles' range of motion? Is it safe or dangerous, Ross? I know you've done an article, I think, on using weights in sort of like with length and positions of various different limbs. Is that, am I right in thinking I've seen that somewhere? Yes, T Nation. It was my first article on T Nation. Um, so essentially, wow. with passive stretching, the thing I would say is, yes, it's fine. Um, but the only thing is, is that when you say do a passive stretcher, you open up a new range of motion. A new range of motion is an unstable range of motion initially until you give the brain a reason for it to become a safe range of motion to put tension or load through. So it's all fine and well doing passive stretching, but I would say... There's a ton of people that just do passive, passive, passive stretching, and then they don't back it up with that that stability or integrating that control through a full range. So I would say it's all fine and well to do the passive stretching, but I would very rarely ever give out just passive on its own, unless I'm using it as a as a technique to induce like a kind of more parasympathetic, relaxing technique. If it's part of improving someone's movement, there has to be an active component that comes with that as well. Okay, got it. Uh, next question. Feel free to jump in, whoever wants to take this one. So good morning. Good morning to Facebook user, um, whoever you are. Uh, I haven't got a great range of motion in my hips due to an injury, something that I can relate to very, very well. So squatting and leg presses are difficult. I have tried unilateral training, but there's still a lot of stress and not any more range with bilateral training. Any tips? Question mark. Who wants that one? I mean, it's totally going to depend on the goal. It sounds like your goal is to squat. Um, you know, if your goal was just, I don't know, muscle gain, for example, I would just avoid squatting movements if they're causing you pain. Like, if you can't do them properly with correct range of motion, just avoid them. Like, there's no reason you can't build muscle doing, you know, leg extensions and leg curls. Um, and, you know, then all the ancillary muscles as well you would have to do then add in like glute bridges and whatever but if it's not something you need to do then you don't need to do it it sounds very obvious but um if it's if getting better at squatting is something that you're really interested in doing then like i would be working with a physio and a coach to try and get there like there's no without assessing you one-on-one -on -one, i can't give a diagnosis i can't anyway because i'm not a physio but i can't um, really say this is what you need to do or that's what you need to do because you might already be doing those things and my advice is useless. Um, or there might be something, you know, even more basic that you need to be doing first. Cool. And just to add to that, maybe from, from my own personal experience, so for those of you watching don't know, uh, I broke my hip five years ago. So my hip's got bolts, metal plates, screws all in it. And that means that my mobility around various different hip movements, lower body movements is very, very limited. So I, you'll never see me barbell back squat. You'll never see me deadlift or anything like that. But that doesn't mean to say that I can't build muscle in my lower body, in my quads, in my hamstrings and things like that. You just learn to adapt. And I, if anybody's listened to the podcast I did with Luke Tullock that I think went out a couple of weeks ago, I talk about the fact that it was just a trial and error process over the course of a period of time to find out yeah. which exercises fit me best. And it just so happens if I want to do some quad-based movements that a lying leg press with a particular machine I have in my gym plus a leg extension are my two go-to exercises. But someone who has maybe even the same injury or very similar injury they might find that those two exercises aren't the best. I mean, a leg extension is probably going to work for most people, but it might be that that lying leg press doesn't really work for you. So I think that it depends what the goal is. I mean, probably if you're like me and you've got a broken hip, probably give up the dream of being a competitive powerlifter. But <laughs> if it's just to build some muscle and to get stronger in your legs, then just think about the principles of the fact that you can 
create tension on those particular muscles. You can create torque around a joint in various different ways. It doesn't have to be with maybe traditional big movements that you might consider to be have to do this to get X result. You don't necessarily have to think that way. So there's lots of ways around it. Um, and if you've ever seen my video where I did uh, the um, risky business, Tom Cruise recreation in my in this very room, I got a lot of comments from the ladies about my thighs. So you know. <laughs> I, I would probably also add to that as well that um, I think it depends. Is like a it seems to be like what coaches like to say most, but the sad fact is it does just totally depend on what the injury was. And and I think yeah, it's great what Nick and Simon have said in terms of if you're looking at kind of muscle gain, there are so many ways to still achieve that without doing things like your squat movement. Um, but if, for instance, squatting is your goal, I'd also think about like what the trade-off is. Like, what's the injury? Can you kind of recover properly? Are you going to give yourself enough rest to do so? And then can you build up your squat? Or actually, is that just going to be a movement that's not going to feel safe for you and not going to be good for your body long term? And if so, then your kind of health and longevity is probably more like more important. I mean, obviously, again. It depends, but yeah, I think kind of looking at your body in a long term view is, a, is quite important. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, well, so, super quick. Yeah, go for it, mate. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I think all three of you have great points. Um, I think for me, the, the phrase I use with clients a lot is um, you can't fight your structure, structure will always win. So if you've got structural limitations, you, there's no point in trying to fit, fit a round peg into a square hole. You're not going to beat that. Um, second thing is, as well, is that finding exercises that fit your structure. I'm sure the muscle mentors guys and the physique development guys will talk a lot about that in their talks, but you know, find things that work for your structure, find movements that feel good. If you're feeling pain, don't force yourself through it. It's just not worth it, like Nick said. Um, and I think a big thing as well is taking the time to nail your setup. It's amazing how many technique and execution flaws can be corrected just by understanding how to set up properly, whether it's a free weight movement or uh, a machine-based movement. Um, and I think with things like, um, like say, free weight movements like squats and deadlifts, I mean, I, I'm passionate about that as well. I mean, I came from a background that was more power-based. Nowadays, I do more physique stuff, so I've seen both camps in depth fairly well. And I think um, people very underestimate the amount of skill acquisition that's required for any movement type, whether it's a free weight movement, a machine movement, a cable movement. All movements have a, a skill acquisition period. And sometimes people try a movement for the first one or two weeks, or they're used to program hopping every four weeks or so, and so they've never, ever given movements anywhere near a sufficient enough time trying different setups, different stances, different tempos, different grips and all that stuff. They've not given it enough time to understand if that is something that truly fits for them or not before they then just discard it and try something else. So I would just say be patient, take the time to understand what fits your structure and actually give an exercise and a movement a chance before you just completely discard it. Yeah. Cool. And uh, another question, we've got questions coming in thick and fast. So I think that we were due to go till nine, but because we started about 20, 25 minutes late, we'll just carry straight on till maybe like half past nine on this one because we've got lots of stuff coming in. And I want to get through as many questions as we can. So if you have questions on mobility, keep on coming in. We won't kind of cut it off short uh, if there's still lots that people want to ask. So the next one up is, I tend to get right hip pain during my cardio, which is usually walking on a treadmill. Uh, so actually not that high impact. Any suggestions of what I can do to limit it? Obviously, there's a limitation on we can't assess anyone. We can't maybe give very much specifics. But are there some general advice we could give someone in that situation? I don't know who wants to fire that question off first. Um, I would say a good starting point is just looking at what's going on around. So what's going on in the hip one and what's going on kind of above and below that joint as well and kind of as we kind of talked about earlier everything is connected so just because you're feeling pain somewhere doesn't mean that that is necessarily the source of what's going on so I think taking quite a broad look at it and trying to understand how everything is connected and what's going on how your knees how your ankles what's even happening in your spine your upper body um and also not pushing something. If it's hurting, take that time to regress, regress, see what's happening before you keep like pushing it harder because, again, there is no point in getting an injury. So, yeah, that would be the starting point, I think. I would just say 
stop walking on the treadmill. I mean, if something is causing you pain, stop doing it. Um, there are other ways to do cardio. Um, if walking outside or around the gym instead of on the treadmill, can you can do that without pain. Try walking elsewhere. If you can use a different machine and you're really stuck to cardio in the gym, then chuck yourself on a different machine. Like there's no benefit over any other machine to walk on a treadmill. And if uh, you only have access to a treadmill, um, I would still probably say stop using it. Yeah. But, uh, fine. Um, what I would say to that question as well is that, like Flo said, is exactly right. Up from what I found is that, first of all, if they've got pain in the hip, where in the hip? Is it the anterior aspect? Is it the posterior? Is it towards kind of the, the inner hip or the outer hip? You, without that, it would be really impossible to know. But good rule of thumb is if it's a, if it's a soft tissue limitation that's causing that, generally speaking, if, say, it was the front right of the hip, if you were to go to the contralateral aspect, which just means the kind of diagonal opposite aspect of the joint, you usually find that the muscle tissue surrounding there is usually fairly bound up or wound up. Um, so by going and getting some release done on that, whether it's yourself or whether you get something to do manually or needling or whatever, uh, you can find that can relieve a lot of tension because ultimately when there's like constant pain that's kind of constantly present, generally speaking, like say you take the hip, you've got the head of the femur sitting in the socket and the chances are it's just not sitting centrated. And so what you'll probably find is that that's sitting right in near one of the edges and it's constantly rubbing and gliding against the nerves. So that nerve doesn't have any room to glide or move or anything like that. So going and seeing potentially like a chiro or a physio, someone who could maybe do an adjustment uh, or potentially doing a bit of traction work to try and get a little bit more centration in the hips can go a long way. That's if the issue is in the hip. But like Flo said, you may have to go way up or downstream to potentially figure out what's actually the root cause. Um, but without assessing someone, like Nick said, it's it's hard to say. And if it's, if you're, it's hurting you now, I would probably say instead of doing cardio that's kind of steady state on a machine maybe use the time instead to work on your mobility but just do it non-stop for half an hour you'll get an aerobic response from just doing mobility for a half hour non-stop cool um no, loads more questions coming in so let's get through um a couple more just make sure i don't want to miss any um thoughts on resisted eccentrics to improve range of motion what are your thoughts mm. do you have any yeah so um, Resisted eccentrics. I mean, I guess there was one of the questions um, I had around, like, so people often talk about, like, what's the benefits of doing, say, like, weighted stretches or any of that sort of stuff. So this might go down a bit of a rabbit hole, so I'll, um, I'll try and wind it in as much as I can. So the benefit of resisted eccentrics or actual just loading the eccentric heavily. So we know, right, when it comes to the key driver of hypertrophy, we know that mechanical tension of the three mechanisms is the key driver of hypertrophy. And so people will often ask, well, why, why is mobility important for, for making gains in the gym? And the reality is, is we know that getting heavy loads into a lengthened position is going to stimulate anabolic pathways such as mTOR, which for those of you who may know, it's mechanistic on mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, and that's one of the key anabolic pathways that we need for stimulating anabolism, right? Uh, but you can only really stimulate that really well if, one, you're actually able to get a muscle into its lengthened position, and of course, to get into a lengthened position, the majority of the time, you have to be able to control heavy eccentrics into a lengthened range. So thoughts on resisted eccentrics to improve ROM. I think as long as you're able to actively control a movement into its end range, and then, for example, this is where like, um, you guys heard of dog crap training, DC training? Mm -hmm. So DC, uh, Dante Trudell and guys like Dr. Scott Stevens and Fortune Training kind of popularized these methods. Um, they used a lot of like weighted stretches. Um, because they knew that, like, well, if we can put a sufficient amount of tension in a lengthened position, we're going to be able to really maximally stimulate that into a pathway. Um, so I think weighted or resisted eccentrics are good. I would, I would want to, I'd be interested to know what he means by resisted though, eccentrics versus actually just taking a load through a full range of motion with a controlled eccentric. I mean, I just interpreting the wording of the question, it sounds to me like a. Like you're just going very, very slow on the actual eccentric part of that uh, that movement. That just sounds, that's just me interpreting the word. I don't know if that's yeah, the, I would, I would yeah. take that as well. So in which case, yeah, I mean, you should, from a motor control perspective and being able to achieve proper patterning of a movement, you ideally would want people to be doing slow eccentrics, potentially through the concentric and eccentric at the start of a training journey. I always use this phrase with people, you have to earn the right to go fast. 
because also my speed is a progression as well, which people often don't realize. They maybe they dive into a CrossFit class and everything's 100 miles an hour, but they haven't actually learned how to coordinate joints or actually move properly yet. Um, yeah, so that would be my thoughts on that. I mean, I, you could start diving into it. It's a bit more complex, the whole length tension relationship thing and sarcomere is shortening and lengthening, but maybe that's a, a question for another time. Yeah, bit of dance by the sounds of it. <laughs> Next one. Um, if you find yourself exaggerating, so this person finds themselves exaggerating their hip hinge when performing deadlifts and RDLs, excessive lumbar extension. Any tips from anyone? Stop filming from behind so no one can see. Um, yeah, this is this um, can be part of this lower cross syndrome that I was talking about before, but it's essentially um, anterior rotation of the hip. Um, and if you're over exaggerating during a hip hinge, like it's hard to say over exaggerating, like there is a point generally within females where they're extending their back so hard that they're going. What's right here? So if this is like a neutral spine, they're extending it so hard that it's like bending backwards. So like going in further into extension than is necessary. And if that's the case, like there's no real like injury you're going to get by going into extension in like a deadlift or an RDL. Like that's not the way the spine works. Like I think it's like 400 kilos or something that a spine, a raw spine with no muscle or um, ligaments or anything around it could hold just in extension. Like it's a crazy amount that it can actually hold. So going into overextension isn't inherently a problem unless it's causing something else to go wrong. So if you're saying you're over-exaggerating your um, hip hinge, I assume that means lumbar spine, like – any tips for that? Try doing it without <laughs> such extension. Like, um, you know, maybe have somebody watching you and guiding you through um, that proper neutral spine. It could just be like a core activation thing. Like maybe you're not lifting with actually contracting your abdominals and you're kind of using your back as the thing that's keeping your spine straight. Try contracting your abdominals and actually using them to keep you in that neutral spine. Because if if this is your back and uh, abdominal muscles, if you're contracting one and leaving these all loose, then obviously you're going to go into overextension. But if you start to contract these ones as well, so your back and your abdominals, as you should in any loaded movement, then you're going to come to a more neutral position than you would have if you only contracted one. Cool. Yeah. I would, I would probably jump in the same. A lot of the time when I see it with clients, it's, uh, it's something that if you kind of address the core, it, it does seem to rectify itself to an extent and also look at the rest of the spine. So like what's happening through the neck as well, because a lot of the time you see people breaking their necks into a deadlift and it has repercussions all through all the way down through the spine. So trying to think of it as a kind of a whole piece as well. But yeah, core is great. Yeah, so, I mean, how I would add to that is um, first things first, people need to understand what their neutral is because there isn't a textbook neutral. A lot of people think there's a neutral spine. You have to find what your neutral is. Neutral is a range between individuals depending on your structure and, and so on and so forth. So the way I kind of describe it to clients is there's a key component to mobility often a lot of people don't talk about, especially stability, which is breathing. And I think Dr. Perry Nicholson of Stop Chasing Pain said it best when he said, if you don't want your breathing, you don't want shit. Of course, he said it in a really southern accent so you can imagine how that sounded uh but learning how to breathe you know obviously you can't control your core musculature if you don't know how to control the deeper core musculature so if you don't have control of your diaphragm that potentially is a big issue i think what this person might be referring to is, is uh, you see this with overhead movements as well people have an excessive rib flare and that is a problem because that can be overloading the erectors the erectors a lot of those kind of spinal extensors which are meant to just be synergists within a movement they're meant to be supporting tissues but they're not meant to be taking such a bulk of the load. Now, like Nick said, I don't think people should be necessarily so worried from the spine point of view. It's more what you try to get out of the exercise. If you're trying to load the posterior chain and you're trying to get the, the hams and the glutes to do the majority of the work, which they should be, then you might have to address a few things. So the way I describe it to my clients is I kind of refer to um, everything in this area, I'll step back, is the can of stability. As so you imagine, you've got the top of the can, you've got the bottom of the can, and you've got the sides of the can, and you don't want to dent the can you don't want to crush the can you want a nice full can because let's be honest if you had why exactly there you go Vogue. 
we'll get out. Um, if you were to take a can that's full of baked beans, it's very hard to crush that can because it's full. So that refers to the breathing. You fill up with air. You get that nice big diaphragmatic breath. You create that intra-abdominal pressure. You get a nice full can, and it's very difficult to crush. Whereas if you're flat, you can just bend that can, kick the can, crush the can. So breathing is a huge component. It tends to often get overlooked. And then the next thing, like the guys exactly alluded to, it's understanding how to, I like to say, you need to get organized before you move. So are you in a position where your pelvis and your rib cage, the bottom of your rib cage, are lined up in a way where as you go throughout your, your hip hinge, just for an example, I'm going to step back here, that you're not then going, I always like to say, you're not bending the can, you're keeping the top of the can and the bottom of the can the same distance apart as you go through that entire range of motion. So you keep the can intact, you keep it in line, you keep it full, and you're good to go. So learning how to hold the can is kind of the way I just it being important. I think it's funny, actually. I, I, breathing is a, a thing I do a lot with my clients as well. And I find myself sometimes at the side while my clients are doing the exercises, doing the breathing with them. So I'll just be like... <laughs> <laughs> and they all kind of look at me like... And I'm like, it's important. But yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, so it's remind like, you. So don't be like, like that with your, your can. Yeah. <laughs> It's like when I'm teaching people to bench press and I'm like, yeah, shoulder blades together and down and I'm standing there next to him like like this and everyone around me must be like looking, what's this guy doing holding his breath and like doing this? <laughs> cool. Nick, I'm going to come to you for the next one um, because I know you deal with some like, athletes and specific like performance uh, athletes in terms of strength and conditioning. This one's more to do with there's an example for cricket bowlers but i guess there's a sports component there um do elite sport performers need good mobility and range of motion can mobility be sport specific i.e cricket bowlers shoulder mobility might be different from left to right yes Good on. Um, <laughs> so yeah it's going to be dependent on like they've already alluded to, the type of sport and then their position within the sport. Um, good mobility for a sport is going to be different to good mobility for a different sport. So, for example, a gymnast is going to have crazy mobility. Uh, let's just say everywhere because I don't do gymnastics. And, um, you know, a powerlifter, their sport, they need to be really strong in certain areas and really inflexible in certain areas. So, Elite sports performers, they they both fall into that category, but they would have very, very, very different um, mobility. So looking at your sport specific, so yeah, if you're a cricket bowler, you probably have one shoulder that is going to be more mobile than the other. Is that something that's good? You know, I would probably try and get equal mobility on both sides, even though you're not using it in the same way. Purely for when you do anything that is bilateral, um, you want to try and be having the same range of movement on each side. Like imagine if you only did half of the rep of a bench press with one side and the full rep with the other side. Like that's kind of what it would end up like being because one on if it's we're using this example, on one shoulder they've got that extra mobility, they can lengthen the muscle further, where on the other shoulder they can't. So they would either be going um on one muscle not far enough if they kept everything in line. So let's use a bench press. They would come down to the extent of their less mobile shoulder. And then their right, uh, their more mobile shoulder wouldn't be getting as much stimulus, um, or they would be going too far on one, and then having either an unequal movement or going further than active range um, on their less mobile shoulder. So, um, you know, yeah, people are going to have different mobility depending on sport position and level, uh, what that sport is. So you might have imbalances like that, but it's important to try and. Uh, recover those imbalances where possible. Um, my girlfriend's an ex lacrosse player, um, and she still has issues now. You know, probably ten years from when she last played lacrosse, um, still has issues now because she only ever shot with one side. You know, there's always this one side, and so she's still having issues now. She's had spine issues, hip issues, all probably coming from an imbalance that was ingrained over years. Got it. Cool. Okay. Uh, Simon, as well. All right, go for it. Yeah, because right. uh, it's, it's an area that I spent a lot of time researching. So um, probably one of the best guys to go and listen to or watch any of his stuff uh, regarding shoulder health in athletes is Eric Cressy. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Cressy is uh, he's an American-based coach. He's incredibly talented as far as shoulder health and everything is concerned. Um, 
And so he did a lot of very interesting work. He works a lot with a lot of the professional baseball players. So to Nick's example, the way he explains it is we use the term like um, relative stiffness. You need to have relative range in one direction and potentially relative stiffness in another, right? So taking the example of those, those pitchers, for example, they need to have a crazy amount of external rotation at the shoulder, but they also have to be pretty stiff into internal rotation because when they decelerate, you know, those fast pitchers are throwing at over hundreds, you know, kilometers an hour. They need to have that stiffness and internal rotation to absorb the force that the shoulder goes into when it gets to the end of that throw. And so if they had to then go, oh, well, let's, we need to improve your shoulder internal rotation, that would literally ruin them as far as a, um, as a baseball pitcher is concerned and actually make them more susceptible to injury. Um, the other example I often give people is if you look at Rafa Nadal, who clearly has one arm, which is like way bigger than the other. Now, ultimately what it comes down to one of these guys is that it's, it's what's the best use of your time and resources. Now, from a health point of view, yes, when he finishes his career, he's going to have to do a lot of work on trying to get some form of structural balance back. So from the athletes that I've worked with who play at a decent level, the kind of term that we use with them is that you need to have an acceptable discrepancy that doesn't that doesn't feed into pain and niggles, unnecessary pain and niggles, but it also doesn't detract from the specificity of the imbalance that you do have that actually contributes to, to your performance. So you have to almost accept an inherent level of imbalance between side. It's just that, like Nick said, you have to understand, are they even at the minimum acceptable level of imbalance or if they're already too far away from that, what is acceptable and how do we bring them up to that so that we're safeguarding them not only now, but when their career is is over. Cool. Well. Awesome. Still got more questions, guys. So if, uh, again, like if people want to ask questions, keep them coming in. We'll go for as, as long as needed to kind of keep you guys satisfied. Uh, so Flo, maybe one for you. Let's see how you uh, tackle this one. For someone starting out who is sedentary, would you start them on just range of motion and mobility workouts, or would you get them doing weight training as well as that mobility work at the same time? I think that's the broad interpretation of that question. Yeah. Um, I would probably start slightly heavier on the kind of mobility, but I would I would start them with some form of weight training at like relatively early. I mean I think as long as you're being safe within the movements you're asking them to do um, and you're kind of partnering that with assessing them and assessing their mobility and making sure that the, they're, they're supporting that as they go through. So I think setting them up with kind of good habits and looking at positioning is really where I start. I wouldn't start chucking like chucking weight at them um, like day like just huge amounts of weight day one. It would be very much like a progressive build up, but I don't think that needs to be kind of like three months mobility work before you even pick up a weight. You know, I think that can be a relatively slow build together. Um, so for someone, and I and I have worked with a lot of clients who have like been or have sedentary lifestyles, and when they come to me, that's been kind of very fresh and new to them. And I think trying to make sure as well at the same time that they're finding some enjoyment within it in the kind of learning of it and they're feeling as though they're being challenged. And I think you have to kind of partner both of those things as you take them through and like progress them. So um, the answer to that question is no, I wouldn't just start them just on mobility. I would do both, but I think you have to be very structured, slow and progressive with it. Okay, cool. Ross, I'm going to come to you for... Uh, the next one, um, I have a tight glute muscle that really limits my movement and range in my right hip, for example, butterfly stretch. Left knee can reach out about four inches from the floor. Right knee is, is like at least a foot without any assistance, any advice. I do see a Cairo once every month, probably quite specific. Not sure you can give how much advice you can give, but what's your best shot at that one? Yeah, I mean, that's one's really tough unless you see it in person, right? Um, I think uh, when they're referring to the butterfly stretch, I'd imagine that they talk about pigeon pose potentially there. I've never heard uh, of that. I think they're talking about where you put your feet together uh, in the middle and stretch. bring them in close and then you push your knees down. Does that make sense? I would give you an right. example, but I'm not wearing any pants. Uh, I, know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think, I don't know, like for me, I, that wouldn't necessarily be a huge indicator of mobility in the hips. Um, but you know, if that is what they're using, then I would just say like, I want to know what they're, I would kind of test on each side, like what's your passive range that's available within each side and then have a look at what they're able to do actively. 
Um, and if there's, depending on what the discrepancies are, both in terms of passive and active range, it would be, yeah, providing some drills which are um, addressing both of those in terms of deficits. Um, in terms of just doing more and more and more stretching, it's kind of like the point we alluded to earlier. If they're, for example, got that imbalance between sides and all they keep doing is stretching, 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 or maybe they see a Cairo, the Cairo's doing some of the adjustment, some of the soft tissue, chances are the issue isn't, it's not muscular, it's potentially going to be something else. But again, I really, really would hate to even haze and I guess unless I've actually spent time assessing someone's structure in person. Cool. Understood. It's very, I guess it's very specific on any of these things, and especially with the mobility thing, you know, even if you describe it really, really well, you still need to kind of see it for yourself, I guess. Yeah, it goes right, like, well, it could be this and it could be that. And just it's, it's so hard to say without seeing the – I'm a very powerful coach as well, so if I can see what's going on, I can start attacking it a lot more effectively. Cool. Uh, next question from Helen Cole. So uh, people who are watching, if you allow StreamYard to kind of you click a button to allow it to use your name, you can have your own name pop up on the screen like this. So uh, Helen Cole asks, what is traction work? Who wants to field that one? I guess I mentioned that earlier and some of the nerve flossing stuff as well, right? So all traction work means is it's say a joint is sitting compacted against like the, the edge of a kind of a joint. All traction work is it's just this idea of kind of moving or repositioning a joint to be more centrated. That's all traction work is. And so how would you do that? Um, you can obviously get physios and chiros will do those sort of adjustments with people. I, because I spent time in a clinic, I do do some traction work with people if they need it, especially when Nick alluded to it earlier nowadays, people are so rounded or if that's such that forward head posture from being on the phone all the time so i find teaching clients how to do some of their own little bit of traction work around the cervical spine can be useful uh but other methods that were popularized by crossfit as well were things like doing banded distractions and things like that so you can utilize um different methods to kind of create a little bit more traction but like with all mobility drills you might create that traction but then once you made the joint a bit more centrated again you then of course need to go and actually put some load through it and put some stimulus through it as well to kind of lock that that new position new range of motion in um, if it's something that's really really hammered in uh, and we found this a lot with some people like if the scapula is really bound up against the rib cage or um, you know the hips really banged up into the top of the capsule chances are you are probably going to have to go and get that adjusted potentially because you can try and do all the tissue and all the stretching but if it's a structural thing and it doesn't need to be structural from a bony perspective it can also be structural from a functional perspective in this case the bone just being right up and against the socket and it just needs to be repositioned and moved by a chiro potentially cool got it um james kent did you get registered for COVID? i hope you did james kent i hope you did <laughs> <laughs> so next one is let's come to i think i've lost who's next let's go for nick uh, Nick, so this person sees a lot of people experiencing lower back pain during and after deadlifts and squats. Though high amounts of back pain can definitely be attributed to poor form, is some residual pain after these exercises, particularly the deadlifts, normal and can it be avoided? Uh, good question. I would say that if your pain is going beyond DOMS after the exercise, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, so if you don't know what DOMS are, delayed onset muscle soreness, um, it's what you normally get when you train a muscle that you either haven't trained for a while or trained it in a way you haven't trained it for a while. Um, so if it's going beyond DOMS, which you will get from like your erectors just being used in that way, um, it's probably you're probably doing something wrong. If you're getting it during the exercise, immediately drop the weight and stop doing it. Like... Um, and you shouldn't be getting any pain during any movement. And if you are, there's something going wrong, stop doing the movement and have someone assess you. Like that's the best advice I can give here. Like pain, like there are differences between pain. Like if you're doing like super high reps, um, you know, especially isolation work. Yeah. Some pain can be um, encountered, but there's a difference between pain and like muscle soreness or the pump. Um, which according to Arnie feels like sex um, or coming actually. Yeah. Um, but so if you don't know the difference between pain and coming, then probably a bunch of doctors. <laughs> um, but no, uh, if it causes you pain, stop doing it. 
Cool. Um, so everybody who's watching, we've got, we'll go for another, I've still go for another few minutes. We've still got another 30 minutes or so before we've got Dr. Mike coming on to talk about coronavirus and various different things around that. We were going to do a little Q&A, but it seems like there's lots of questions coming in on this topic. So it kind of makes sense that we keep these guys hanging around and answer some more of your questions. So if you get a lot of value from this, then hit those kind of like emoji buttons, the thumbs, the love hearts, the stuff like that to these guys some love for all the uh, information they're providing you. We've got another question coming in, another question. This sounds like we're getting a little bit more technical now. So maybe this, I'm going to guess, can't see the Facebook user, but I'm going to guess this is a trainer. Uh, tips for overextension of the L spine. Anecdotally, I've experienced people overextending their L spine when doing RDLs because they're looking up through the C spine, looking at themselves in the mirror potentially, maybe doing some stuff for the gram. If you control your diaphragm and keep your head in path of the motion, I've experienced this correct. This corrects the issue. So I guess I'm not sure if that's a question or not, but um, he's giving the statement that, uh, that a question doesn't take. He's delivering the tip. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, with the kind of RDLs and the um, lumbar spine kind of and the breaking of the neck, you know, so, yeah. What I would say to that is that just because – that might be the thing for some people, but some people might have, for example, their chin tucked, it looks good. Like you look at the movement, you're like, well, this looks perfectly fine, but then they stand up after the movement and say, well, I still feel back pain. Mm -hmm. So then what is that? And essentially, like, you can't overlook the importance of internal focus and intent as well, because something might look textbook, but if it doesn't feel good, then you have to start going and looking at, well, what? It might look like you're structurally good, but are they contracting the right tissues? Are they stabilizing the right way? Are they using synergists as a prime mover. And like Nick said, for example, the erectors are doing way too much work, for example, or the neck's doing way too much work, and rather the, the, the glutes and hamstrings doing what they're meant to do, which is lengthen and shorten that movement, right? So so I think um, it can definitely, yes, it can resolve a lot of people's issues, but it won't necessarily be the thing that fixes everyone's um, ailments with regards to how it Okay, cool. Uh, question uh, I can see now. I've got the, the stream from Facebook on one side of the screen and the questions and stuff on another side. We're getting very pro at this whole thing right now. Um, so <laughs> this, this is from Chris Borg is this question. So Chris asks, I have hyperlordotic lower, lower back. Does that make barbell squats, deadlifts, etc., not ideal for my structure? Um, not necessarily. I think, um, like um, Chris, I alluded to it earlier. Sorry, I forgot your name there. That is ridiculous. Um, so, like he alluded to it earlier, so I was like mesmerized by his beard. Um, so like he alluded to it earlier, there's not flexion of extension of the spine while you're moving. If your structure is hyperlordotic by structure and not because you're putting it into that position, as long as you're able to maintain whatever your neutral is throughout the, mo the movement then generally speaking, you're going to be fine. Now, the only thing I would say is, yes, both anecdotally and from a research point of view, people who have hyperlordotic lumbar spines will generally experience a little bit more compressive forces. But these are also the same individuals that may not benefit from doing, a, say, a chain-style Olympic lifting completely upright squat. These are some of the individuals that will actually benefit from more of a, maybe potentially like a low bar, hip hinge-focused squat, where it's a little bit more hip-dominant. So I think the thing is, is that I think we... Chris was touched on it earlier. It's kind of like, well, there's a squat for everyone. It just might not be the style of squat that you're maybe chasing after. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, if you've got a hyperlodotic lower back, you just need to learn how to brace and stabilize within your own constraints. Well, I'd add that as well. Is I think we touched on the kind of breathing thing earlier. And I think kind of giving people, making sure you have like a real awareness of what's happening internally and within your own body and kind of, I think especially when people start and beginners tend not to have that kind of awareness physically. And I think having that and understanding your body and what's pain, what's kind of discomfort, what's kind of actually it's feeling like it's working. You can kind of identify a little bit better what feels safe and what doesn't because of what you're trying to achieve with it. So I think kind of increasing that awareness physically from starting from very kind of small steps like breathing can help with all of this kind of understanding. Cool. Awesome. Right. Uh, next question. Got another couple coming in here. So can't see who this one is. Uh, but the question is, 
Thoughts on using isometrics and muscle energy techniques like PIR and RI for increasing range of motion. Should they be included alongside passive stretching for increasing a person's mobility and range of motion? Who wants that? Ross wants that. That's a Ross. <laughs> um, thoughts on using it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a method. Um, like I said, though, you can use those sort of methods. I mean, I think these guys are maybe referring to like active isometric techniques at end ranges. Uh, I'd imagine that's what they're talking about. Um, if you come from like, I don't know how familiar you guys are with like, for example, um, Dr. Andrew Spina and the kind of FRC realm of kind of thinking about movement and increasing range of movement. So their big belief system is around, you know, you need active range control in order to lock in ranges. So for example, they use heavily a lot of um, kind of manually assisted and self-made isometrics at end ranges um, in order to increase range of motion. So if the question is, what's the thought of using both kind of proprioceptive techniques and manually assisted techniques to increase range of motion? Um, Sure, but like I said, then it's you've got to know what's the what's the reason why I'm doing those and what's that going to cross over into. Because if I were to do take someone to like a bit of an FRC style session and they wanted to improve um, active range in their hip capsule, chances are we've already discussed right. There's a reason why there was an end goal as to why they want range in that particular place. It might be that someone, for example, really struggling with the that that last part of the bottom of the squat and they just don't, do not have the active rotation in the capsule to externally rotate enough to get in there, um, then that's a specific goal and you're training towards that. But um, I think, to be honest, again, without knowing what the what the goal is behind doing these techniques, it's, it's difficult to fully answer whether it be beneficial for that individual or not. Because like Nick said, if you've got someone who needs relative stiffness or, or looseness in a particular position, then um, it might be... Are those techniques useful? It's hard to know without the context. Hypotheticals. Got it. Um, there is a, there's a question come in from Andrew Philip Robson, which, Andrew, I've not forgotten your question. I'm just going to skip over it, though, and come back to it because I'm going to go for a, a less sort of techie question. Uh, so for maybe people who aren't necessarily so familiar with some of the lingo, we can give them a specific um bit of advice so does strength training this is valeria does strength training contribute to mobility work what's the least amount of additional mobility work you can get away with there we go the floor is it depends what you're trying to get away with um <laughs> you can you can do none and still live uh and you can do heaps and get super mobile. So it depends what you're trying to do it for. Does strength training contribute? Yeah, if you're using proper technique. Like if you're doing, I don't know, front squats or high bar squats and you're using full range of motion, then yeah, that's definitely going to contribute to your squat mobility. Um, if you're using RDLs or straight legged deadlifts and you're using full range of motion, then yeah, that's going to contribute to your you know, posterior chain or particularly your hip mobility um strength pops posterior chain but um you know it, do they contribute yeah they definitely contribute but in the same way that you know we were talking about the loaded stretching before um you know it's just loaded stretching that is part of your movement if that makes sense yeah. it, it definitely does work and especially if you if your goal is to get better at a movement like for example if you wanted to get lower in the squat you could do some pause squats. If your technique's good enough, eventually pause squats right in the bottom of your hole, not that hole, um, that will eventually lead to you getting deep in the squat. Okay. Yeah, I would kind of lead on from what Nick said in terms of it really depends on what your starting point is. So if your starting point is absolutely no mobility and anything you're doing is the kind of like not anywhere near full range of motion, um, then it's probably a good idea to look at those movements you're trying to achieve and establish full range of motion within them um, first before you start loading up loads of weight. I think in terms of the least amount you can get away with, yeah, Nick's right. It depends, like, you can get away with none, but it's probably not the right thing to do, <laughs> you know? And I think um, instead of thinking what's the least amount I can get away with, think, okay, what am I 
um, willing to de- what what time am I realistically willing to dedicate to this? And I think the extremes of things kind of put people off and kind of the belief that the idea that they'll have to suddenly start doing mobility work and they're spending, you know, an hour on it every day just because they want to be like the most mobile person ever is kind of what puts them off actually even starting. And, you know, you could sit there and say, I'm literally only willing to think about this for five minutes every two days. And do you know what? That's still better than nothing. Um, and that's still something. That's still a start. And if you can achieve that, you can probably a couple of weeks down the line go, oh, do you know what? I could probably do this five minutes every day. And then, you know, I think I kind of touched on the habit formation stuff that we touched on earlier. Um, don't go. If you're not going to change into a new person overnight and just, you know, be like, okay, right. I want to spend an hour and a half just like feeling my body. It's, it's going to I spend an hour and a half feeding my body every day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just as maybe then, like just following on from what you're saying there, Flo, is just maybe to give people a little bit of a an understanding of what we do. So maybe they look to people like you, uh, us four and others to say, well, okay, what do these kind of like people who do this for a living, what do they do? So in terms of like mobility, specific mobility work, how much time personally do you spend doing that sort of thing either every day or every week? Do you have a specific routine you do every day or is it something you do only on training days? Just to give people a little bit of a flavor for what you actually do. Um, So it's something I do every, kind of, I would say every day. I mean, I'm not superhuman. So every now and again, I do just leave it out. Um, and you know, if I'm not training it definitely on training days, I do it because I'm in the gym. It seems like part of my routine and it feels kind of part of that. I'm not, I mean, having a relatively active job anyway, um, being in the gym with clients and stuff. Like I don't tend to have, I don't have a kind of sedentary lifestyle. And for instance, this change has meant that I'm spending a lot more time, like sitting down at a desk kind of on my laptop and I can feel that physically so I'm kind of doing a a little bit more to try and compensate um and I would say so I I used to be a dancer that's where I started and I got injured out and we I kind of touched on this with um Nick and Ross the other day it's a bit like you don't use it you lose it so I kind of used to be so mobile and I used to do it all the time it was just like such a normal part of my lifestyle because it had to be and I probably, when I transitioned, I had to stop dancing. I I probably neglected it more than I, well, I definitely neglected it more than I should have done. And now having to start those routines again and bring them back in is so annoying. It's one of those things, like the, the hard thing is starting. And then once you've established those habits, they're really easy to maintain. And I would encourage people to then try to maintain as much as possible because why restart but yeah I tend to do it kind of daily if not every day I train which is usually about five times a week okay cool uh Nick what about you cool it's on um I like at the moment I don't do that much stretching because I'm suffering from a bunch of injuries my mobility is kind of like in the areas that I can for example um I'll use a very specific example I snapped the tendon off this finger um about six months ago now nice. and i had it in a cast for 12 weeks and the doctor was like yeah if you put it in a cast for 12 weeks and don't move it at all the tendon will grow back and i was like you're full of shit mate like that's definitely not how it's gonna work <laughs> and after 12 weeks i took the cast off and it had grown back but because i'd had it straight for 12 weeks i couldn't bend it at all um so my main mobility at the moment is just working on like gripping things and like a lot of you know anything you can grip with your right hand is good um and I, like it's getting there it's all can you guys see that on the camera like it's yeah. almost full range of motion like it's probably not as strong as it used to be like i find um of 12 weeks with doing no grip training on that side my deadlift really suffered um but yeah so my daily mobility the thing i'm really concentrating on the moment is trying to get my finger back to working um because fingers are important Fingers are important, indeed. Yeah. There's the quote for the uh, for the live. Fingers are important. Ross, down below here, what, what what's your sort of like mobility daily, weekly time look like? Yes, I probably have quite a good story to actually share with us. So I think to answer the question, first of all, is 
like with building muscle, building strength, building mobility, you need to do a lot more of it more frequently and beginning to acquire it. The good news is, is that for a generally good acceptable level, it's quite easy to maintain. You don't have to do as much to maintain as you did to acquire it. I think most of us kind of see that with muscle. Like you can go through periods where you're having to work really hard to build muscle, to build flexibility, and then it's quite easy to maintain a good level. However, if you're performing at the kind of advanced level of things, then you can't achieve extraordinary feats of stuff without with doing average amounts of work, right? So there is a kind of point you get to where if I want it to be exceptional, I have to keep doing more repetitive work. But generally speaking, once you've developed mobility, it's quite easy to lock it in. In terms of my own mobility, um, when I was doing competitive CrossFit, I did the whole going to regionals thing and everything else. And I used to do quite a fair bit of mobility with that because naturally I was training like, you know, four or five hours a day. And certain periods I would need more of it than others. Funny thing was when I switched over to physique training, it's almost as if I kind of just forgot mobility existed. And kind of, oh, I don't need it as much anymore because the tasks are not so demanding. But how wrong I was, like the amount my body got beat up from doing more of the physique style training, I've had more of a need to put mobility as a priority back in again now than I ever have. And it's purely because when I was doing a lot of the CrossFit work, my body was going through, even though it's still going through that one sagittal plane of motion, it was at least getting exposed to a lot more flexion extensions of the spine. And I was just exposed to a slightly wider range of movements. Whereas with the physique based training, I'm just not getting exposed to that that much. Um, and with our own business, we're spending more time sitting down in front of a laptop. So, of course, that factors in. Uh, and so my hips are the worst after kind of when I got the first six months into doing my physique stuff. My hips and knees are the worst they've ever been. Um, so it's like I mentioned earlier, it's very much a case of it's, it's task dependent and it's context dependent. I think uh, now I'm trying to do at least some form of mobility every single day. But back when I was doing CrossFit, if I happened to miss it the odd session, it didn't really it didn't really make that much of a difference because I'd done it for so long over so many years that and I was training so many hours a day that it just kind of, I could just pretty much train and I would tick that box. Whereas now I can't get away with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just for, just for completeness, I'll tell you what mine is. So I basically do, uh, try to do 15 minutes every morning of a specific mobility routine and twice a week, try to do something where, I maybe try to do some specific advances around a particular uh, area. So particularly for me, like hips and things like that, because of hip injury, I kind of try to work on that a little bit more. So maybe twice a week, I focus a little bit more on that. Um, I have to confess with arranging this, I've done nothing for the last five yeah. days. So <laughs> I'm probably the most immobile I've been for a long, long time right this minute. Yeah. Um, so this is a slightly more longer question. So I haven't pre-read it. So let's, God knows what it says. This says, with regards to packed neck on deadlifts, I saw Lyle McDonald, which for people who don't know who he is, he's kind of like a uh, an industry guy, uh, looks into research and all that sort of stuff, explaining why he doesn't think it's important, stating that no competitive powerlifter has ever injured their neck purely from looking up on a deadlift. I have clients who round through their thoracic spine and or lumbar if they look anywhere but up. How important would you guys say a neutral head position is when deadlifting? I think, Ross, you might have touched on that earlier with terms of head position. Um, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, again, it's uh, I never like to use the phrase it depends without explaining why yeah. it depends. Um, I think for the majority of people, if you're looking at just health and longevity, it's just good practice to obviously have the cervical, lumbar, um, and thoracic spines kind of three points of contact, as we often refer to it as. However, yes, if you look at the elite levels of sport, those guys are going to lift with slightly curved lumbars. They are going to potentially crane their neck. They're just trying to create as much force as they physically can to get the movement done. And let's be honest, for a guy who's maybe trying to squat a thousand pounds or more, or dead off, for example, Eddie Cohen and these guys deadlifting over a thousand pounds. They're not that interested on the impacts on their health that that's doing. They want to break records. And so if you're a competitive athlete in any realm, there's an inherent amount of that that's just it's not healthy for you because you're taking the body to such a, an extreme state. Um, so I think for, for performance, does it make a big difference? And for some PT clients even, if they happen to have a little bit of a crane neck and that feels comfortable for them, if they're only doing, like, say, 20-odd reps a week of that movement, Probably not the end of the world, uh, but if everything they do in day-to-day -day life is like crane neck, forward head posture, and then you're then exacerbating that when you come to the gym to see you and they're not a competitive powerlifter, 
then I would argue that it's probably just worth sticking more closer to what's comfortable for them or for what's best practice. I think one uh, thing... Sorry, sorry Nick, before yeah, I... Um, I just, it just came to me now. A lot of it comes down to people is that there's um, essentially known what's called convergence theory. I don't know you guys know much about that, but essentially like where your eyes are directed or looking will often dictate a lot of what your brain feels good doing or not doing or the amount of force it wants to produce. And yes, like for some people, compressing the cervical spine can say, for example, reduce force output through the glutes, uh, whereas for another person it won't. But the one thing I would say is that you, that from a neurological standpoint, if someone's got a packed neck, if they look up when they deadlift versus doing this, both of them are going to have a very similar effect, at least from a, a, a convergence point of view, but whereas the neck position may not have the same outcome. So my cue for people is usually if they want to, like when they're squatting or when they're deadlifting, if they want to try and increase neural drive, so to speak, is to think more about eyes up rather than head up. That's just a personal preference. Other people may may or may not disagree with that. I mean, I think the key thing that you touched on there, Ross, is that if they're only doing a certain amount of it, it doesn't really matter. But there, there's the optimal technique, the perfect technique, which would be, you know, neutral everything, you know, lifts like a god. Most people aren't going to get there. Um, most people are going to be somewhere on the spectrum between that and lifting like you're a dog trying to do a poop. Um, <laughs> and somewhere in there is where you're going to be. And to try and aim for optimal is obviously great. Um, but it doesn't mean that until you can get that perfect rep, you can't deadlift or you can't do whatever the lift you're trying to do is. And if you're, you know, craning your neck, if, you know, going in, to cervical spine extension uh, means that other parts of your spine are in a better position, then go nuts. If it doesn't cause any pain, go nuts. Um, you know, you look at people who are, you know, like the guy or girl who asked the question um, asked, they they gave some specific examples of, you know, people at the top end of the game are doing this and it's working. Yeah, for their um for, for their body type and for their body shape and the way their you know where their muscles attach and the way their skeletons put together and all these things are all very individual to that person which makes them a very good probably deadlifter in this case and you know if that is something they feel comfortable doing and they have all these other things in place that make them a very good deadlifter then where their neck is is probably going to have very little effect at all and it's probably more like psychological for them where they feel like they're lifting their head up they're you know moving in that direction it's probably not having an actual effect on how good their deadlift is okay cool um cool so we've got about uh five minutes and three questions to rattle through so be as quick as you can first question is coming to nick because it's addressed straight to you big nick at the beginning you said about static stretches before a strength session will hinder your strength have you got any or can you point me to the direction of any papers to read over love to learn more on this maybe probably not going to rattle them off the top of your head but no, I got it. I got it. I came prepared. Um, the Scandinavian Journal of Medicine and Science and Sports uh, did a um, meta-analysis on all the literature in this area in 2012 um, of does pre-exercise static stretching inhibit maximal muscle performance, performance uh, meta-analytical review. So if you search that, um, I'll try and respond to that comment in um, the thread. But if you search for that, um, and look for the meta-analysis, <clears throat> you'll find all the info there. Yeah, sure. So just hit Nick up in the DMs or something like that and him yes, on the with you. Um, and also as well, if you go on my Iron Paradise Fitness YouTube channel, I did a podcast about how stretching impacts um, those sorts of things. And within that video, if I remember right, I flash up maybe two or three different studies that um, alluded to what Nick's already kind of just talked about there. So there's another way for you to get that. Um, two more questions before we finish. What do you think about animal flows for mobility work? Maybe Flo can answer the question about flow. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually, I haven't encountered animal flows. It's something I um, uh, trained when I was actually doing, back when I did my course, um, was doing and I thought it was quite cool I mean coming from a dance background I quite like that kind of movement I found it quite interesting I think it can be um quite good actually I think it you are moving through um 
I think it's good for physical awareness, like where you're placing your body. Um, things like breathing, it has quite strong on. It's um, probably great in terms of like looking at your placement. Um, so I can't see why you couldn't incorporate it into what you're doing for your mobility work. Um, I'm not sure it would be the be all and end all, um, but why not? If you enjoy it and you find it an easy thing to fit in, then sure. Also, I think um, something to add there is that, as Flo put on the end, is if it makes you do more mobility work, go nuts. Like you can call it whatever you want, but if it's something that gets you doing it, then do it. Cool. Awesome. Right then, uh, let's go to Ross for the last question. Ross, you've got about five minutes to rattle through this one. Uh, could changing your squat, e.g. barbell back to goblet squat or even a front squat improve your execution of the movement and improve your connection? Question mark. Cool. It's a good question. Um, I think, again, depends on the context. If they're talking about from a really feeling, what I, I'd imagine this question is probably geared around feeling the quads working better during a squat. Um, yeah, I mean, it just depends if you're someone who is used to squatting, say, for example, more hip dominant or versus more knee dominant. Um, often why most people would switch to, say, a goblet squat is because they're struggling to stay more upright in a squat. Now, why is that important? If you if you can understand basic biomechanics, we understand that essentially a longer lever, when a lever length or a lever arm or a moment arm gets longer, there's more torque generated in the muscle at that given position. So, for example, if you do a back squat, and say this is the neutral point, and your current barbell back squat looks a bit more like that. So that's the midline. If you've got like a longer lever or a moment arm from the midline to the hip, and that reduces the lever arm from the midline to the, the knee, then that means you're not generating as much tension in the quads as you potentially would want. Now, in terms of the front squat, a lot of people think, oh, if I switch that front squat straight away, that that's going to make it more quad dominant. But that's not necessarily true either. Reason why is that depending on that individual, depending on how well they're able to make a front rack with the squat or what position that bar is in, depending on how they execute that squat, there might actually not be any difference in the lever between the hip and the knee. Because if you actually look at holding a bar on the front, holding a bar on the back, and then you get someone to do it, for a lot of people, the levers don't actually change all that much between a front and a back squat. Uh, there was a really good write-up on Squat University about that specifically in terms of torque demands uh, from quads to glutes between front and back squats. Um, so why is a goblet squat potentially a good idea? If it allows someone to achieve, or a front squat, if it does allow that individual to achieve more torque, i.e. more force production from the quads in that movement, that might be a good time to switch around. Um, I would argue potentially if someone is struggling to feel um, squats in their quads, maybe select a slightly different movement, maybe alter the movement in a way that allows you to achieve a higher degree of torque that you're looking for demands that you're looking for from that muscle. So that might be something like a heel elevated goblet squat. It may be something like a front foot elevated, uh, like a heel elevated split squat, for example, where you can really bias or emphasize that, that lever. Um, so could changing it, it depends on the individual. Um, for some people, they'll, they'll be able to load up a back squat and feel the quads super, super well, in which case that's a great choice for them. But for others, changing to something like a split squat or a goblet squat may be a good shot as well. Just depends. Awesome. Cool. So I think we're 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 done almost. Um you've got oh, oh. which <laughs> is um oh, I I lost her. Jesus. I, <laughs> static stretching hindering oh that oh, we covered that one already. Oh yeah, so whoever is that it, is, it's the same study I just posted yeah, in response to the other guy. So the question is there's a little bit of a bit on the end. Is that the case for sports as well, like running and sprinting? Yes. Uh, the best thing I would say, go to Brett Contreras did a fantastic write-up on, on that. So if you go out and look up Brett Contreras' uh, blogs, he did a great um, article on stretching and uh, sprinting and running. Awesome. And just just for shits and giggles, here's some nice um, replies back about the last hour and a half you've given up for your time. So really enjoyed this. Thank you. I'm trying to find out who said these things. So Joanna Claffy, Claffy oh, bad with names. That's who said that. Anyway, um, John says, thanks. Great webinar. Awesome. Thanks, John. Cheers, bud. I love the way you deliver your answers. No BS approach. Awesome. There we go. So then, guys, I think we are all done. 
Thank you very much for um, what was a slightly delayed start to the whole thing, but we managed to get there in the end. We are still live, I believe. We are still providing some, some entertainment and value. Um, so thanks for your time. You're all coming back at some point over the course of the next two days anyway. So really if you've watched this, you've enjoyed it, make sure you follow these guys on Instagram. Make sure you hit some hearts and some thumbs ups and some love buttons or whatever they're called on this particular uh, live stream as well. Also, you can take pictures. So I can see that my Instagram DMs are slowly filling up with tons yes. of messages from people about tagging me and stuff and stuff like that. So keep doing that. Keep taking pictures of the screen, these lovely people with their lovely faces, plaster it all over Instagram, hashtag COVID-19. That would be absolutely awesome. We would love you forever for doing that as well. So thank you very much, guys. And we will speak to you very, very soon. But if you're watching this live, we're just going to continue live streaming. I'm just going to kick these guys out slowly yeah. by one. So see you guys later. They are gone. You're left with me. So sadly, now you are left with me for pretty much all of this whole thing. So in between all of these various different talks, what we're going to be doing is lots of different Q&As. And this is the opportunity for you to ask questions. Maybe that's something if you're looking through the running order, you're looking through the schedule and you're saying, well, I've got a question, but it maybe doesn't quite fit anything. So maybe I want to still ask it. These little times between each of the talks is your perfect opportunity to do that. Now, this if we'd have run to time, we'd have had an hour for us to go through various different topics, but we haven't. So um, we are going to be cracking straight on in about four minutes time with Dr. Mike Banner. And we're going to be talking all about actual coronavirus type stuff to answer lots of the questions, trying to get a bit more clarity and probably bust a few myths about what's going on with all of this sort of stuff with Corona. Now, before Mike joins us, we'll wait for him to join. I have got a few questions lined up. So these are questions that have come in by people who have filled out the questionnaire. And one of those questions is, let's try to tackle this. What daily habit would you recommend for the, the most for a killer mindset? Now, I don't know what a killer mindset necessarily is, for, so that could mean lots of different things to lots of different people. For me, probably a killer mindset in the context is, I think, being productive, getting stuff done, being uh, achieving your goals, taking steps forward and things like that. I would say the thing that helps me the most with that sort of thing is journaling. And it's something that I definitely encourage my clients to do on a regular basis. So that's a process whereby I do it once in the morning. It only takes like five minutes, once in the evening as well. So to plan for the next day, to reflect, to maybe plan like really kind of like three things that you want to achieve in one particular day. Maybe you reflect, you do some gratitude and things like that. That process of planning, of making sure that you are really kind of structured with what you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve it is crucially important. Now, I'll give you another example. So when clients come to work with me, often they're quite busy people. They've got very busy social lives, busy careers. And so trying to fit in health, fitness, thinking about nutrition, thinking about going to the gym can be quite complicated. They can It can be quite overwhelming. So what one thing that I would highly recommend that they do is every Sunday is just sit down and just look at what's ahead. Look at what's ahead in terms of your social events and things like that. Have you got birthday parties? Have you got, you know, date night, restaurants, whatever it is that you're doing that you have to plan for? Because the more you think about this sort of stuff, then the more you have the opportunity to create a workaround for it. It doesn't come as a surprise. Therefore, you can think about, you know, if you're, say, dieting or something like that, you can think about, well, what approach are you going to have to make sure that you feel in control of your nutrition? Nothing's really going to take you off course. Obviously, there's going to be things that do come as a bit of a surprise and, and things like that. But more often than not, you can plan for lots of these different things and you can create opportunities, whether you are manipulating calories, you're managing calories across the course of a week, and therefore you might have some slightly higher days, some slightly lower days, etc. You become much more in control 
it much more considered with all of your actions. And then what I also think that that leads to is less what we call like decision fatigue. So I'm sure you've all been in a situation whereby you've got so many decisions to make that you just get tired of making decisions. And then you kind of think, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm just not going to do anything. So reducing the amount of decisions you have to make on a daily basis helps things to actually progress a little bit quicker. Now, this is all like a learned skill. No one kind of starts today and is massively good at making epically the right decision every single time. And probably no one does that anyway. But I think the more that you practice it, the more that you journal, the more that you go into these sorts of things, then the better you are going to be at developing that mindset. And I think that, again, one of the things that um, works really well for me is people often, whether it's say for like me in a, like a business context or for you in a health and fitness context, we often go into things thinking that we have to be awesome. We have to be like this pinnacle of this is what we want to achieve and nothing else is going to ever be good enough. We always go into that sort of situation. Whereas I think having a sense of ambition, a sense of desire is great, but kind of tempering that with not necessarily pessimism, but realism to say that, yes, I want to achieve this. I want to go to the gym three or four times a week. I want to be good with my calories and stick on track with a calorie deficit and things like that. But then having that touch and dab of re realism to say, well, I'm not going to be perfect all the time. And that's okay. And being having a bit more like self-compassion to say it does it. I'm not going to beat myself up every single time I haven't achieved this perfection that I wanted. I'm going to be more easy on myself. I'm going to be more compassionate and allow myself that little bit of digression from what I wanted to achieve. And I think going into these things with that mindset that you it is okay to not be perfect, again, helps you to be more consistent. And then that consistency is what then delivers. Now, I can see that Dr. Mike has joined. So by the powers of some form of technology that I am, let's facing it, winging right now, let's bring Dr. Mike into the Hello. picture. Here he is.